When churches are banned from meeting, but protests and riots are allowed, welcome to our indoor prayer protest. We're going to pray till Jesus comes. I have three points for you today, and I'm speaking to three different audiences. First one and first point. Church, wake up and don't submit to, to an unbiblical tyrant. Speaking to the church. Point one. Point two. Is your church run by a hireling or by a shepherd? Speaking to pastors and those in authority, leaders in the church. Point three, speaking to the governor and governing authorities. Governor Newsom, let me introduce you to King Nebuchadnezzar. So our first audience is the church, the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. Why y'all looking at me like, <laughs> do we not have authority? And the authority comes through the name of Jesus. And all the spirits are subject to us. And I just taught you this on Thursday. So the problem is we have a weak and timid church that doesn't know their authority and confuses rebellion with authority because they don't know the difference. But not this church. Say, this church understands the difference. Okay, so first audience, the church. Church, wake up and don't submit to an unbiblical tyrant. Acts 5, 29. Peter and the other apostles answered, and they said, we ought to obey God rather than men. When you are being forced to stay locked in your home and out of your churches, when you are told you cannot sing in church, nor are you allowed to have in-home fellowships, in-home Bible studies. That's the newest and latest and the greatest, if you haven't heard that one yet. That was just as of this last week. Banning in-home fellowships and in-home Bible studies. He's saying that's banned. Are you kidding me right now? No, that's ridiculous. But you are permitted to have unlimited number of protests and riots. You are allowed. To, this is illegal. It literally is illegal. And it's unconstitutional. The First Amendment protects the right to worship as you please without government interference. Amen. We have to know what is right, what is our legal right and our biblical right, constitutionally and also by the word of God. Like I told you on Thursday, Jesus is not a Democrat and he's not a Republican. He's a king. He is the king and his word is law. It's rule. And we live by the word. And when he goes, when the world, standards of the world tell us anything contrary to that, we first and foremost obey the word of God. So there is no pandemic exception. There's no, there's no exception because of a pandemic to the United States Constitution and to the Bill of Rights, just so that we all have that clear. Okay, it's not like, well, there's an exception to our, to our rights because there's a, there's a flu, or is it a bacteria? No, I think it's a flu. I don't really know what it is, but it's something. There's no exception to our constitutional rights. No one is going to be able to chain the Word of God. No one is going to be able to arrest the Holy Spirit, even though they may try. They may try, and they are trying. They're trying right now. But no one will be able to be successful. When Peter and the apostles were imprisoned for preaching Jesus, when they were healing the sick, the angel of the Lord brought them out at night and told them to preach anyway. And we're going to read that story. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 5. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 5 in verse 12. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. 
Yet none of the rest dare join them, but the people esteemed them highly. So there were some looky loos. Basically, there were some people that were looking and going, wow, but they were too afraid to join, but they were looking. But that's okay, because when you go to verse 14, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets, laid them on beds and on couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding city to Jerusalem, bringing the sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. They were all healed. Let's look at verse 17. Great, praise God. You know, they're out there, they're doing the stuff. Say, we're doing the stuff. Look at verse 17. And then the high priests rose up, and all those who were with him, which were of the sect of the Sadducees, religious rulers and leaders, okay? And they all rose up, and they were filled with indignation. And they laid their hands on the apostles, and they put them in the common prison. So here we go. Now they are in prison at this point in time. But at night, so look at what happens at night. At night, an angel of the Lord opened up the prison doors and brought them out. Who brought them out? The angel of the Lord brought them out. Who put them in prison? Yeah, the Sadducees, the high priests, put them in prison. The officials, those that so, so supposedly knew better. They knew so much. But the angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out. And what did the angel say? Verse 20, go, stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. Wait, 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 wait. I thought we were supposed to submit to the governing authorities as, as Romans 13 states. Did God forget his word? What's going on here, church? Of course he didn't forget his word. Of course he did not forget. But any time God, when any time there is an unbiblical, wrongful, I mean demonic power, telling you to go contrary to the word, we've got to realize that we do not submit to a demon spirit, to a bully spirit. Abigail knew this. Do you guys remember the, in the Old Testament? Abigail and Nabal? Her obedience to the prompting of the Lord caused her life and the lives of others to be spared of tragedy. But Nabal, which was her husband, which name, his name, by the way, means fool, he went to his folly. He was bound on going his own way. Abigail did not submit to what he told her to do. Was she wrong? No, because he was telling her to do something that was contrary to the word of God. We have, as, as believers in Christ, we've got to grow up from the elementary things and realize that we, of course, have an attitude of submission and we pray and we're going to do, as, as it says, submit to the governing authorities. But we, you got to know your word. you got to know what the Bible says. And you've got to be able to discern what is truth and what is not truth. And therefore, there are times that it's going to look like to other people maybe that you're going contrary to something in the word like Romans 13 but according to God he is saying you are protecting the integrity of my word you are protecting the integrity of it and that is a must it is a must for the church to rise up and realize who we are we're not in kindergarten anymore church it's time to rise up it's time to wake up it's time to wake up so there are times that submitting to wrongful, unbiblical authority is actually ungodly. And like Abigail, we're not going to submit to stupidity. She didn't submit to stupidity. Let's read. And here, verse 20. I want to make sure you guys are getting this point. In verse 20, the angel of the Lord went completely against what, what the 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 high priests and the Sadducees just got done saying in verse 17. How many have a Bible open this evening? How many can see it in, in black and white? In black and white. You can see it on the screen too if you're on verse 17. 
The angel of the Lord in verse 20 said the exact opposite thing of what verse 17 just stated. Are we all on the same page? Shake your head. Yes? Okay. So go, the angel of the Lord says, go into the temple and speak. Do what you're called to do. Don't let man dictate when I've called you to a higher place. It's powerful. Let's go down to verse 28. So here they're confronted. Verse 28 and 29. Did we not strictly command you? Here's the, here's the rebuke. Did we not strictly command you to not teach in this name, in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and you intended to bring this man's blood on us. Speaking about Jesus, you're, you're trying to influence all these people for Christ. You're trying to bring his blood on us. In other words, we don't want to be guilty for what happened. We don't want to hear your gospel. You're trying to bring that gospel upon us. We're indignant is what they said. They said, be quiet. You just got put in prison for it. I don't even know how you got out of prison. The angel of the Lord got him out. And then the angel of the Lord said, go and speak. I'm just trying to help you understand here what the word of the Lord says. Because you know what? When, when, when good people do nothing, tragedy happens. And we don't have anybody to, to blame except for ourselves. if that's you. But not, it's not going to be you. It is not going to be you. Because if you're a part of this church, we're going to make sure you wake up. Amen. Because we love you too much to keep you, to, to allow you to just fall through the cracks because of fear or because of believing a lie or, to, or because you, have real, you didn't realize who you were in Christ. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. It's time to wake up right now in the name of Jesus. Wake up, wake up, wake up. No distractions. I bind the spirit of distractions right now. Wake up, wake up, wake up. I speak that over each and every one of you right now. Let's look at verse 29, because Peter and the other apostles answered, and they said, hey, we hear what you're saying. We know you're indignant. We know that we're not following after what you want us to follow, but I have to, we have to obey the word of the Lord. Look at what it says. We ought to obey God rather than men. Everything we do, we do it in an attitude of submission, in an attitude of love. It's not an attitude of pride, arrogance, because God would not, that, you know, you'd be knocked down right away. So the, always the attitude, the motive, we always search our heart. We always ask God to search our heart. But what I'm trying to wake up right now is people that have fallen into a place of fear, of people that have fallen into a place of, of despondency and despair when it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be because you have the answers and the answers are all in Christ. Amen. Amen. So what's going on? Now I'm still speaking to the church, I'm speaking to you. Why? Why would any pastor or church leader want to succumb to shutting, close, closing their doors. You guys, it is wrong. It is wrong. You may say, well, that's your personal opinion. No, it's not. I'm reading to you what the scripture is saying. I mean, there may be reasons, and I don't know all of their reasons. I can list a few. Lack of faith. Lack of faith or lack of understanding the power of God. Yeah, lack of wisdom. Deception to the real issues at hand. You know deception creeps into the church. That's why we got to pray for discernment all the time. We got to pray for our leaders too. You need to pray for us. We need your prayers. Because deception, the enemy doesn't, he's very crafty. We need to be praying for our leaders, spiritual leaders, church leaders. We need to be praying for them. Because especially in times like this, that doesn't make them bad people. But deception is pretty, it's running rampant right now. So another reason, I just listed a few, lack of courage. Some are just truly too afraid. They're afraid of being getting in trouble. So there are a few reasons, and there are many more, I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure there are some elder boards and I'm sure there's some insurance companies that are telling them don't meet because of you don't want to get sued. But that, that again goes to the finances. That again goes to the pocketbook. I'm just saying, you know what? You cannot think that God is going to entrust you as a leader. And I know I'm speaking to some leaders in this room with God's word and his people and then shrink back in fear 
The first time that something crazy like this, and everyone's like, oh, it's such a pandemic. Oh, it's unprecedented times. You know what? There's nothing new under the sun. You know what? God's power is greater. You know what? God says, yes, walk in wisdom. But he says, don't shrink back because I've already, I've already done it. I've already been victorious, and so are you. It's the enemy's agenda to keep you isolated, to keep you, if he keeps you isolated, he will, we know what's going to happen, is he'll dub you down, your fire starts to go out. You know, we're having revivals. Some of you guys know about the revivals, right? Amen. Praise God for revivals. I'm glad, I'm happy that they're having revivals. But like I said already, I choose to live in the fire of the Holy Ghost. Uh, see, if you're having a revival, that means something died. If you're having a revival, something needs to be revived. Is there a, play, a place for that? Absolutely. Are we grateful? Yes. Because you know what? Jesus is coming for a bride that is sold out. If they have lost their fire or they never knew it in the first place, never knew Jesus, then there's a place for revivals. But I want to present to you something, something higher. How about living on fire for Jesus? Why do we always have to go back to revival? If you're revived, if you need to go back to revival, that means you, gotta, you actually have to repent first. Because revival comes when the church repents. Yeah. Did anybody ever tell you that? Did you ever remember reading this in the Bible? When we repent, revival can come. But we are going to live in the fire of God's love. Oh, I got some scriptures here today. Let me tell you, let me tell you. But it's all the word of God. You cannot love the world and love the God of the Bible at the same time. Okay, you got to choose. Choose this day whom you shall serve. James 4.4. 4. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Something to think about? Mm hmm I think so. Seriously, you know what? We were, we were, when you got saved, you got saved so you can live an on-fire, radical Christian life. Not, not half in and half out. When it's easy, I'm going to praise. When it's not, I'm going to hide. So now to the pastors and to the church leaders. And I'm saying this because not everybody comes to this church on a regular basis. You need to think about where you're placing yourself. Because whatever and whomever you place yourself under, you're going to receive what comes from the top, whatever they have, good or bad. Amen. So is your church under the headship of a hireling or a shepherd? When Church leaders are being offered stimulus checks, recovery checks, and other payouts. I'm going to tell you like it is. You know me. I will tell you like it is. You don't have to wonder what I'm thinking, and you don't want that anyway. Okay, so when they are receiving all these payouts so that they can be quiet, so they can, so they can remain content... I'm sorry, but I have a problem with that. And I'm not afraid and I'm not ashamed to say that. I have a problem with that. And you should too. So what is a hireling? One who only works for pay. Turn your Bibles to John 10, 11 through 13. I am the good shepherd, Jesus said. The good shepherd lays down his own life for the sheep. But the hired man who merely serves for wages, that's a hireling, who is neither the shepherd nor the owner of the sheep, when he, sees, when he sees the wolf coming, he deserts the flock, and he runs away, and the wolf snatches and, and the sheep and scatters them. The man runs because he's a hired hand who serves only for wages and is not concerned about the safety of the sheep. There, there, of course, there's going to be a level of concern, but the greater concern is going to be their pocket. Matthew 10, 28, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. When we go into ministry, now I'm speaking to the ministers, and 
when we went into ministry, when we said yes to Jesus, when we said we want to lay our life down, not just as a Christian, but as one that is, is going to, that, that the people can come to, as one that is going to come to a higher standard. Teachers are held to a higher standard. So if you're in the ministry, if you're in a five-fold position, you're held to a higher standard. When you said yes to that, you didn't say yes to that as long as it was convenient. You said, yes, I will lay my life down for the sheep. Jesus laid his life down. We are to be like Jesus. You know, we have not lived in a time as the American church. We have not lived in a time like we are living in today for the American church. So, so much of the American church is being challenged right now. But challenge is good. If you listen, if you heed, and if you change. If you listen, if you heed, and you go, you know what? I'm all in. Today I choose to be all in. Forgive me of any fear of looking at this, of allowing somebody else, some elder board, allowing somebody else, some insurance group to convince you that you cannot open those doors because the lawyers have told you you'll get sued. Don't even think that's not happening. It, it is. And what does that make? How do you think the father feels about this? Grieved. If this is not your church home on a regular basis, you pray. You ask God what you're supposed to do. You need to seek his face. And you need to pray for your leader. Doesn't make him or her a bad person, but they certainly could be gripped by the spirit of fear or so deceived they don't even know because they've got all these people speaking into their ears and they are trying to decipher what's what, but they got way too many voices coming at them. I'm just trying to give you a little glimpse of what happens when you're a leader of a church. So this is not a cut down. I understand the why, how it could happen, we just can't let it continue to happen. Amen. Point three, to the governor and to those that are in governing authorities. So positions that are higher, right? In authority over us. King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Why don't you turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter one. King Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. He captured Jerusalem. Daniel 1.1, 1, 1, he forced the surrender of Jerusalem. Forced the surrender. He forced, captured them, made them do what they didn't want to do. Does this kind of sound like some of the body of Christ right now? Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and he besieged it. Forced its surrender, captured it. He captured Jerusalem, but he also destroyed Jerusalem by breaking down their walls. Can we put up Jeremiah 39, 8? He captured Jerusalem, but he also destroyed it by breaking down their walls. Oh, think about right that. Come on, if you have a prophetic ear, if you have a prophetic anything in you right now, hear, hear what's happening. Let's break them down. Let's take away what's so important to them. We understand there's an agenda. Uh, we understand the why. It's wicked. It's wicked. And it is an agenda. But God shall prevail. But let's, let's tear them down. Let's tear down their, their, their communities. Let's tear down. We can't let them congregate because you know what we've learned is that when they congregate, there's power in their praise. There's power when the word is preached. There's power when they lay their hands on one another because people get set free. There's power. Let's tear them down. Let's break them down. Let's just chip away these walls. So the Chaldeans burned the king's house and the houses of the people with fire and broke down the walls of Jerusalem. What did King Nebuchadnezzar do? He captured Jerusalem and he destroyed Jerusalem by breaking down their walls. Do you remember what was stated in Nehemiah 1.3? 
And they said to me, the survivors, now we're jumping ahead, but the survivors who were left from the captivity and the, and the province are there in great distress and reproach. They were left in, in reproach, in great distress. Do you not think that's exactly what the enemy wants to do to the church? Leave them in great distress after everything has been stripped from them, after they haven't been allowed to gather, after, after some time where, where not only does the fire go, go out of them, but also the complacency sets in. Because they get used to comfortable, another situ a comfortable situation. Come on, you got, we can't have that. I want you to see how, how similar this is, what's happening right now with King ne Nebuchadnezzar and what he did. The survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. And in Nehemiah 2.17, he said, come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we will no longer be a reproach. Our walls have to be built up, church. We can't walk with broken down walls. We, you know, a broken down wall is you being robbed of your rights in Christ. A broken down wall is you being mandated to be isolated What's a mandate? I order you. Okay, great. I have an order that's higher than yours, and it happens to be from the King of Kings, and it happens to be the one I'm going to obey. Amen. But we are called in Isaiah 58 12 to rebuild the ancient ruins, to raise up the age old foundations. You will be called a repair of a repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets in which to dwell. That's not just Jesus, but that's you too. We're called to repair. So let's see some of the things that King Nebuchadnezzar did. He captured Jerusalem. He destroyed Jerusalem by breaking down the walls. And he who has a prophetic ear, let him hear, let him understand what that looks like. Because it's happening, whether you see it or, or not, it's happening before your very eyes. He also carried away the articles of the house of God and brought them into his own treasury. He stole what he could. He stole what was important. He stole what was valuable. He stole what was holy and he put it in an unholy place. Look at Daniel chapter 1, verse 2. See, some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, into the house of his God, and he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. How many of you have made a parallel of what's happening right now in the world and King Nebuchadnezzar? Can we put up 2 Kings 24, verses 13 and 14? He carried out from there all of the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and he cut in pieces all the articles of gold which Solomon king of Israel had made in the temple of the Lord as the Lord had said wow so chill and then and then also children were ta the children of Israel were taken captive to serve King Nebuchadnezzar so we'll go back to Daniel but I want to read verses 3 and 4 so he says to bring some of the children out he says bring the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles young men in whom there was no blemish but good looking gifted in all wisdom possessing knowledge and quick to understand and who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and the literature of the Chaldeans whom they could teach I, I'm back in Daniel 1 verses 3 and 4 that's where, where I'm at right now so they took so basically, they carried away the people, the children were captive, taken captive, the people taken captive, right? But they also took the best of the best to serve in his palace, right? So they could teach them the ways. Well, we know Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, we know that this tyrant was there and, and he pulled the best out of the best. But don't forget, there were thousands, 
thousands of captives taken from the land of Judah into the Babylonian captivity. And in those stories that we read, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were the only three standing up, what about the rest that were taken? They all bowed down. God always has his elect. Are we going to be God's elect? If everybody is bowing down, if everybody is, is justifying, are you going to be God's elect? Because God always has his elect. But it's a choice, like Daniel had decided ahead of time, to set his life apart, to be apart, separated. And not only that, but the Jews then, once they were in captivity, they remained in captivity for a long time, 70 years, for a long time. Do you know history repeats itself? It has a way of repeating itself. If you don't do anything to stop it, it has a way of repeating itself. If rebellion starts to harden hearts and, and blind minds, the minds of people, and if hearts start to wax cold because you've removed yourself from the source, You've removed yourself from biblical values, from truth. Then you can see how easy it would be for history to repeat itself. I understand. You guys are, you're on fire. And I'm not saying that to tickle your ears and to be, and to flatter you, because I won't do that. But it's true. I do believe. And I was telling this to my husband. I said, you know, churches attract certain people. It depends on who is at the pulpit, who's, who's pastoring or apostle of that church, what they carry, who they are. They're going to attract people that A, are like that, and so they feel like they fit in, or B, they're not quite there, but they like what they see, and their spirit is saying, I need that, I want that, I need to, I need to go there, because I, I want to receive what they carry. And so I say this to say, I know that this church is on fire for the Lord and sold out and bold and courageous. Does not make us perfect? Okay, we're perfect in Christ. But is there any areas that we need to work on? Of course, everybody does. Everybody has them. But I know that you guys are bold for Jesus. You're on fire. And I know that there's varying levels of maturity, even when I say that. And that's okay, because the desire to, to reach for the more of God is so there. It's so there in this place. And I love that. I love that about, about us, about what God has entrusted me to steward. I love that. I'm very grateful for that. So, recap. Capture Jerusalem. He destroyed Jerusalem by breaking down the walls. Don't let the world, don't let this, this, this system break down your walls. Amen. Carried away the articles of the house of God, brought it into his own treasury. Took all the people captive, and then for 70 years they remained there. But then, then King Nebuchadnezzar had that. Well, he had a couple of dreams, but his second dream, he had this second dream, and Daniel interpreted it for him. You guys remember this part of the story if you read this recently? Um, but his advice was conveniently not taken. Let's turn to Daniel chapter 4, verse 27. So he has this dream. Daniel interprets it. King Nebuchadnezzar does not heed what he had to say. Because he had to say this, renounce your sin and be kind. So the people that you have oppressed, uh, okay, so, so, so that this dream's not going to come into fruition, basically. Let's read. Let's read what it says. Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous. In other words, come on, be, get right. Get right with God and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. This was a rebuke, a, a stern but gentle rebuke. He's trying to say, hey, heads up. If you want this, if you want things to go good for you, go well for you, you'd probably want to repent, live righteous. But we know that he doesn't do that. And so King Nebuchadnezzar was led into the wilderness to eat grass like an ox, like a wild animal. We know he lost his mind. He became like an animal. His hair had grown like, like, like feathers on an eagle. And he had these, his nails were like claws, the claws of a bird. He was like an animal. And for seven years, he's roaming around like a wild beast. You can read this in Daniel 4, 33. 
In Daniel 4.33, you can put it up. It says it right there. Just like a wild animal roaming around. You know why? Because pride, okay, haughty spirit before destruction, pride before the fall, pride is going to get, it's going to destroy anybody that continues to walk in pride. And when you go to Daniel chapter 4, verse 30, you see, if you didn't already figure it out, that pride was his downfall. Look at verse 30. The king spoke and he said, the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar spoke and he said, is this, is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? Wow, right? Really? Maybe you ought to sit down and you think a little too highly of yourself, King Neb. You know, we need to pray that the demons that bind our governor and other political leaders and thought leaders of this world, that the demons that bind them would be completely loosed from their minds. Because that's exactly what we have. This man went crazy because a demon spirit multiple demon spirits came upon him. Don't you think for one minute that's not what we're dealing with right now with our current governor. But he needs our prayers. He needs our prayers. True humil humility and submission to the God of heaven and earth became so real. Because it needs to become so real that there is turnaround. Look at Daniel 4, 34 and 35 because the day finally did come when this prideful, evil man lifted up his eyes and gave praise to the king, to the true king of kings and to the true Lord of lords. See, here we see, at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven. Seven years later, true, but at the end of the time. He said, and my understanding returned to me. My mind, my mind came back. Like I was so tormented and deceived, but my mind came back. It returned to me and I blessed the most high and praised and honored him who lives forever for his dominion is an everlasting dominion. And, and, it, and it goes on. All It says, the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. Verse 35. He does according to his will in the army. He does. The Lord does according to his will. Sounds like he learned something. What do you think? Yeah. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can restrain his hand. Well, praise God. He, he learned something. Praise God. That's what we need to be praying for our governor, for our officials, for our leaders. That's what we need to be praying for the eyes of their understanding to be opened up for, we have to have spiritual discernment. I'm trying to help you right now, get spiritual insight and discernment because there isn't anything new under the sun, but it is our job, not just to have the insight and the discernment, but to pray because we carry the power of God. God says, this is why I don't want you to not assemble because when you're together, right? Iron sharpens iron. Mm -hmm.